um, when we have a disjunction, we're going to eliminate it. So do you recall the rule that we talked about on Tuesday, which applies to eliminating the disjunction? It's disjunction elimination, right? Now, just a quick note, I know I don't have the rules up on the board. Uh, I also know that I meant to show you the rule sheet in the, in the back of the book. I will do that, but let me also say that on Canvas, uh, but also in hard copy, you have or will have the rule sheet, right? So my advice to you as you're getting used to these things is this, whether you're looking at the textbook or you're looking at the handout that I'll give to you, uh, or you're looking at the notes that you've taken, when you're looking at an argument whose conclusion you need to prove, you should go back and forth between the rule sheet or the rules and the proof at hand, right? Because that, it's like saying, oh, you know, I can't remember a formula for the area of a square. Let me look at my rule sheet. That's the rule. This is what I do when I'm trying to determine the formula, for, or sorry, when I'm trying to determine the area of a square. It's similar to that, right? And then as you get really used to it, your rule sheet just becomes like a security ganky, right? And you don't even need it because you know the rules. Okay, so we said that when you have a disjunction, you're going to eliminate it, which is to say you're going to derive the sentence you want by saying, well, let me assume that the left side of the disjunction is the case, derive the sentence I want. Let me assume the right side of the disjunction is the case. Let me derive what I want. So I can say, in either case, I have the sentence I want. Why do we do this? Why do we make these two successive subproofs? Right? Why do we enlist the successive subproof sequence? You already know it's because the disjunction is true in three ways. So when you're told, here's a disjunction, you're, you're going to say, OK, I'm told the sentence is true, but I don't know how it's true. So let me assume I have one side. Let me assume the other. Right? That way I'm covering my bases. But we started with the left side where we said, I think it was based on this really, I think it was a really nice point, Shimon, that you made. Um, something along the lines of what's the point of that indirect truth table, right? Or how do the truth tables kind of play out here? Well, remember, when you have an argument that's valid, you know that it is impossible for the conclusion to be false while the premises are true. Impossible how? Well, when you try to say the conclusion is false while maintaining true premises, you generate a contradiction. Well, in the uh, system we're learning, that contradiction is a literal truth functional contradiction, right? I assume my conclusion is false, and then I generate some contradiction up above in my premises, whether they're given or derived, and that contradiction has to do with the truth definitions of the connectives, okay? So you might be saying, I kind of remember this, or you might be saying, me is going wah, 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 I'm not listening. Or you might say, yeah, I totally get this. Just know who you are so that you can know what you need to focus on or, or not. So we did this. We said, and remember, you in order to work on a line, right, your, so your cursor is going to be, is going to appear, sorry, where that slider is on the far left, that horizontal triangle? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Country is not here. Like, hey, good, I got the right word. Right, so what did we do at line three? We said, well, let's assume the conclusion is false. Right? Sorry, I didn't mean to highlight this one. We said, let's assume the conclusion is false. We want to generate a contradiction, right, because the conclusion has to be true if the premises are true. So we say, well, let's assume the conclusion is false. We know we want to generate a contradiction so that we can get out of that assumption and say, see, we can't maintain the assumption that we set out with at line number three. Okay. Now, 
will say, okay, I think it was James maybe who said, hey, I see the implicit contradiction, right? Take a look at line one, take a look at line two, take a look at line one, take a look at line three. The contradiction is implicit. Why? Because a contradiction is, in truth functional terms, is a sentence and its negation, right? So you need P and not P all by themselves. Same with Q and not Q. So how do we get P all by itself? Well, we look at the disjunction and we say, the only way to get P all by itself is to assume that we have it, okay? And I know this is a little bit more complicated. Remember I had uh, mentioned Tuesday that this work we're doing right now is presented as if we've been working with this stuff for a couple of weeks, okay? Um, we're going to, once we're done with this, we'll back out and work some uh, easier proofs. James, what are you thinking? So, sort of the secondary nested. Um, yeah, the nested subgroup, yep. The nested subgroup. Yep. Um, when you use that, that is used ex almost exclusively as um, presenting a, um, I guess, like a secondary scenario that yeah, yeah. contradicts or is true for in another situation. Um, yeah, well, in this case, in this yes. Case, yeah. yeah. So, so what James James saying? Well, kind of what, what's the point of a subproof? More specifically, saying why do we make this further assumption? It's what's called a, a nested subproof. Well, here's the the short answer. The short answer is because it's going to get you what you want, right? But the longer answer is is this: um, you know already that in any argument, the givens, the premises. The suppositions are just what you take as true in order to proceed, right? So the subproof is, in visual terms, a way of expressing the following. I've already got these assumptions. Now, let me further assume. So, exactly. And so James said, based on the assumptions you have, yes, but also, and this is going to be crucial for us based on where we want to go. So let me give you just a quick example of what I mean by this notion of a strategy. Sorry, I can't get, scratch my itch. Okay, here we go. All right, so break over. Okay, so um, suppose that you and I want to meet up in Hollywood to go to the, the Grauman's or whatever it's called, Man's Chinese Theater, because we're going to go see us. I'm excited about it, aren't you? Oh my gosh. But I'm scared. I'm really scared. Okay. I'm just, well, I don't know. I'm just saying, let's suppose that we are, but I'm going to go. Now, I'm kind of thinking that, no, I'll probably go to one of the arc lights because then I can, it's, it's uh, designated seating and, and, and then I can have my caramel popcorn. Why, 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 why are you saying that? Are you really, you're going to go to the Chinese theater? <gasps> okay, tell me how it goes. It's such a beautiful theater. Okay, so, so right, we've got this in mind, right? We're going to go to Hollywood. We're going to go see us at the Chinese theater. Now, where are we, guys? We're in Woodland Hills. Now, is it what? 20 miles tops to Hollywood from here? But a world away in terms of traffic. So we say, so what do we do? Andres, I bet this is what you've done. You said, okay, we're going to see us on Friday night in Hollywood, and we're leaving from Woodland Hills. What time is the show? That's where I need to start. My goal is to be seated by 7.20. Let's just suppose that's the case, right? My goal is to be seated by 7.20. I got my popcorn. I got my soda. Okay, what do I need to do to get there at 7.20? Well, crap, Friday night traffic, parking in Hollywood, popcorn line. You're like, <laughs> right? So you might need to just spend the day in Hollywood. But, do you, but right, you're using your goal to set you up, given where you are, where you want to be, okay? Think about a marathon, right? Or, or anything involving a, you know, a, a, a finish line. 
you don't just start the marathon like this, or maybe you do, but when the gun goes off, you it's not the case that everybody just goes in 18 directions. Why? Because the goal, the finish line, James likes that one, the goal, the finish line is set up in advance. The goal, the finish line is set up in advance. Your job is to follow how you get, follow the path to get there, right? So what we're doing when we're setting up, especially, this goes back now to part of James's question, when you're setting up your structuring subgroup, this is a template, it's a blueprint, it is strategic thinking that gives you the big picture, okay? Then the derivation itself is more tactical thinking, okay? <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't look at you James said that. Like this is me. I was thinking of like some weird Comedy Central sketch where <laughs> a key every, heel. Yeah, like where everyone is in line ready to race and it looks like they're about to race, and then the gun goes off and they all just sprint <laughs> right. and then it's like the office so cuts to an interview. It's like, yeah, I've been doing like improv marathoning for like years. <laughs> <laughs> improv just, marathoning. Like, I could. I That's just, like, very had funny. This whole sketch idea just popped. Write it, baby. Write it. Get it oh, out there. Right. You guys live like, in a great era where you can put your your work out there, right? It's not just hidden away. And your that's all. I love that's very funny. It reminds me a little bit of the um, who's the guy who oh, crap. He's got long ginger hair, and he does these. Oh, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to look it up. I don't want to waste your time, but he does these things where he's like the new agey, really tolerant guy. He's just this oh, really God. what. No, well, I, you know what, Tarzan, I don't know. I'll look it up. I'll look it up, and then I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. But um, it's he's very funny. It reminds me a little bit of, like, he just sit there and he's like, yeah, you know, I've been doing improv, marathoning for forever. And you just think, this is so ridiculous. Okay, we, we've had time to think about stuff now. Yay. All right. So further assumption. P, what are we after? Well, here now with this nested subcrew, right? We look to the goal, which is currently number six, right? So you're continuously backward working, right? The goal of the structuring subproof is a contradiction. The goal of the structuring subproof was, we, was set up by us from line eight, right? I'm assuming the opposite of the conclusion, right? But now, and I'm sorry, Tarzan, I'll give you just one second. With number six as the new goal for this second subgroup, the nested subgroup, now it's going to be the contradiction. Uh, the, the, oops. The contradiction, so that we then get out, start the next one, Q, right, and so forth. How are we doing? Are we okay? So set up the second one, then we want a contradiction so that we can get out and say, See, I've just derived a contradiction in either case. Okay, so hold on to that. Sorry, Farzan, what are you thinking? So, I'm not looking at this as like a complicated problem. Can you say a little bit more for those of us who are not computer science yeah, literate? Yeah. Good, okay. So, this is set up as like a if statement. It's almost like if P1 and 2 don't happen, we skip all of that. Or if P So two things. One, just as a technical point, the sentence P or Q is true functionally equivalent to Okay, so that's just one quick point. I don't know enough about your discipline to successfully answer that question. Maybe somebody else does. What I will say is I believe it should be the case when you're coding that you're setting up every possible scenario and like a proof by cases, eliminating. So if they pick this choice, whoever they are, they're playing a game, that means all these other choices are eliminated. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm Right. So if, if, let's just use the word if. Right. If one and two happen, is it true? Yes. Do you skip to nine? Uh, you would skip to, well, no, to, so strictly speaking, you'd skip to 10. What is 10 right now? Yeah. 
I think that would be oh. the, what you would do in coding. I think that's right. I don't know, James, uh, John, John's nodding. James, what do you think? Yeah, no. So, if you want to put an offset thing, I would think of like one, two, like variables that you can call, and then some of the nested subgroups are just little statements for that business, and you're just like typing in like a little key. Sorry, that's 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 one of like a simple way. variable, and see if like this mm. is true. So then, not Q, you want to see if Q is not true, and if it is not true, then go through and see if Q, if Q is true. But yeah, so, so that would be okay. I'm following through with this scenario, but because I, I, so if I'm understanding what James is saying correctly, but because you're coding for all possible scenarios, you have to say, but yeah, but what about if then, what about the scenario in which they choose this path, right? So this is one of the cool things about looking at uh, the, and we are using Boolean logic, right? Uh, where we, we actually have with negation, conjunction and disjunction, everything that we need. Um, I don't know why it is the case, um, although it does make sense, that in uh, coding you, you, you do have the if then gates, right? Rather than the, the and or, although I think you use those as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, what does this, how are we doing? Does this so make some sense? What are thinking? Like slow down the line and right. explain how things happen. Okay, how so. Are we comfortable with the following? One and two are our premises. Ten is our goal or our conclusion. And in fact, don't forget, you know, our, our authors set us up with the word goal, right? And especially when you're making your own exercises, which is really, really fun to do, you can say, okay, new goal, I'm going to put this in here. Um, Functional, or sorry, uh, in terms of the algorithm of the program, it's 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 good to assert the goal because then you can be sure based on what the goal constraints are. Let me just show you these really quickly. Based on what the goal constraints are, um, you can add or delete what what your scenarios are, uh, what the parameters are for your scenarios. Okay, so just real quickly, I've shown you that. Okay, so we're, we've got our goal. Now, this is what we did. We said, remember the indirect truth table from Tuesday, right? We said, okay, uh, P or Q, not P. So Q, we said, let's assume that these are true, but the conclusion is false. That's line three. Assume the conclusion is false. Now, what happens when you say that the conclusion is false, but the argument is valid? You run into a truth functional contradiction. And I want to say it was Heather or Matt, I don't know who it was. Somebody pointed out that you can generate your contradiction in two places, right? You can either generate your contradiction at uh, the, um, sorry, at the second premise, right? So here's the false conclusion. Now, in order for the disjunction to be true while we're assuming the conclusion is false, P has to be true. But now notice that you can't say not P is true and P is true. There's one contradiction. The other place you can generate the contradiction you probably can imagine is the disjunction itself. You can say, okay, let me go ahead and assume, um, uh, sorry, back out of that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me go ahead and say, okay, if not P is true, then P has to be false. I'll go ahead and plug that in, right? In order for P or Q to be true when P is false, Q has to be true, but oh no. Well, sorry, I'll do this. I contradicted, I have contradicted my uh, truth definition for the disjunction, right? So that's what's going on, guys, from lines three through eight. Yeah? Okay, so, and again, if you don't like this, there are other ways for us to go. Remember, I think I've said something like the following before. Some people will say, Mia, don't explain this stuff. Just tell me what to do. I want to just learn the mechanics. 
when I see this, I do that. When I see this, I do that. And other people say, Mia, I can't learn the mechanics if I don't understand what I'm doing. So we're going to toggle back and forth between those two. All right, so we started line three, right? Not Q. Then we said, hey, I noticed that one and two and one and three involve implicit contradictions. I need to make those explicit, right? In deductive logic and derivations, there's no, oh yeah, I already see that, let's move on. It's no, you see it, you say it, <laughs> right? There's no skip step, no matter how obvious it seems to you, okay? Although Fitch does, I think we talked about this on Tuesday, Fitch would let us go from eight to 10, skipping nine. And I'll show you that when we're, when we're done. All right, so we assume P, two, and four, can you see the highlight okay? Two and four are highlighted. Take a look at the right, uh, the, the um, place to the right of line five. It says two and four, and then the rule is, do you remember the rule? Introduction of the contradiction. Now, I know I owe you, based on Tuesday, an explanation of contradiction E limb, and we'll get there. But remember first, Every single one of our connectives has an intro and an alim rule. So intro alim for negation, intro alim for conjunction, intro alim for disjunction. The contradiction symbol in truth functional terms, remember, is this. So contradiction symbol means P and not, whoops, sorry, I can spell, I can spell my contradiction, means P and not P. Okay, so it's just a shorthand way of saying, look, I'm telling you two and four are contradictories. Okay, now, why are we ending this first nested subgroup at line five? Because our goal at line eight is a contradiction. So we've established our contradiction from lines two and four to discharge the left side of the disjunction at one, get out, immediately start a new subgroup where we assume Q, right, that's the right side of the disjunction, and we see that lines three and six are contradictories, so we assert it. Now we're done with that nested subgroup. We get out and say, I have just shown, and if we look at the rules, and we will again, from lines one, four and five, six and seven, that I've got a contradiction. How do I have a contradiction? By an elimination of the disjunction. Now, before moving on, I want to remind you about this cool feature that we have. We can check our individual steps. So sometimes if you get an X, like remember we did on Tuesday because I had messed up and I inadvertently nested when I shouldn't have done, and I got an X, I went, oh, now I see why. When you get an X, you, that's a great signal that something's gone wrong. It's either you know something substantive or it could be just something like, hey, you're using lowercase when you should be using capitals for the propositional logic notation, right? So Fitch is really good about that. We'll check our step again. And then here we've got our subgroup. We get a check. Now, remember I had mentioned that you don't, oh, sorry, <laughs> Renee, go ahead. You don't have to uh, introduce that second negation, um, or at least Fitch won't force you to do it. I like to do it because technically you started with the negation. When you generate a contradiction, you're now saying it's not the case that not Q, right? That sentence, not Q, is false. Yeah? So here, lines three through eight, negation intro gets us not not Q, and then we hardly ever get to use it, so why not, let's just do that now. From nine to 10, 
remember truth functionally, we eliminate, and the negation, right? Because two negations are truth functionally equivalent to an affirmed sentence. So quick question for you, even if, you know, you might feel like things are a little bit um, cluttered, right? Like I, I know that, you know, my, my, my mental life is, is fairly, more often than not, just a, just a whirlwind of, of chaos, right? And I, it's hard to keep things straight. So if you're feeling a little bit cluttered, that's fine. Um, I'd like you to think about what you are comfortable with. And I'd also like you to think about um, whether or not that discussion from Tuesday in terms of showing the truth functional basis of these rules makes sense to you. Okay? So don't be shy if they don't. I mean, yay, if you got the thumbs up, I'm excited for you, right? But remember, we, we don't all learn at the same pace. Things get, you know, I get things at different times than other people. There's no kind of right way to be here. All right, so questions on this guy. Farzan, what are you thinking? I, I don't follow. Oh, you mean a truth table? It's hard to, yeah. So, okay. Um, the truth table will tell you that an argument is valid, but it won't tell you how to demonstrate validity. Does that make sense? Now, there are um, truth trees. So maybe one thing, so we don't learn truth trees in, in this version of the of the course, um, but but sometimes people use them, and so maybe what we can do is take a little bit of time to to present that method. And if you say, "Wow, this is great, this works for me," that that might help you a bit. Um, but in terms of the table itself, like so far as I know, no. Yeah, so what you'd, okay, what you'd need to do, and this is why it's a little bit tricky, you'd need to lay out one, two, three, four as your premises, but then five you would need to be able to say is false, right, because it's a necessarily false sentence, without, uh, well, I mean, then you'd, you'd get part of your contradiction. I think it'd be pretty complicated. I, I confess I've never done it before, but maybe we can try it sometime. See, keep, hold on, and I'm not saying no, but let's keep moving forward and see if, as we move forward, forward retroactively, things start to make sense. Kind of like reading through the end of a book, and then suddenly the beginning makes more sense. All right, so on this side, oh, sorry, Shuman, what are you thinking? Um, on mine, too. Yes. Uh, why did the uh, police use three sentences? So it's like, on mine, three, the opinion is not three. Yes. So Yes. And then on mine six, we have, we said two again. Why did we say two without three or something? Great question. Here's my snotty answer, but I don't mean it to be snotty. Well, because we're following the disjunction elimination rule. That's my, right? I know that's not satisfying, is it? <laughs> okay. So, so let's think about it this way. We were given not P at line two, right? Here's a question for us. Why didn't we just say, oh, well, that means that we have a contradiction between P and, and not P, so why can't I just pull down Q, right? And in some versions of the system, that move called disjunctive syllogism is a legitimate move to make. What we are doing in our version of the system is we're saying we're actually going to prove why a disjunctive syllogism uh, uh, works as opposed, as opposed to just saying we're accepting that it works. So now to push a little bit closer into the territory that you're asking about, um, when we say we have P or Q, remember we don't know which one we have. So we say, well, let's assume we have one. What follows from that? Let's assume we have the other. What follows from that? Even if we know that we have two and we know that we have three. Does that help a little bit? Yeah? 
Now you might be more interested in this in the one on the on the on the right, this proof, right? So what have we done here? We still have the same goal, right? We still have the same premises, but notice that we've started, here's what we've set up. Let me just show you real quickly. We've said, oh, I have a disjunction in my premises, so I'm going to assume the left side of the disjunction and derive what I want. What do I want? Q. That's my goal, right? Just like over here, my goal Q set up, uh, set us up starting with line three, but then the goal of the subgroup was eight, which set up a further uh, assumptive sequence, right? Okay, so, so I want Q, so I'm going to say, all right, well, I'm going to assume P, I want Q, that's my goal of my subgroup. Then I'm going to assume Q, I want Q, that's the goal of my subgroup, so that I can say, look, I've just said in either case, I have Q. Yeah? All right, so now let's talk about the sequence. You guys already know that 2 and 3 are what? Contradictories. So we've just generated a contradiction. Now we get to the, hey, wait a minute. Why, Mia? Why is it the case that from a contradiction, anything follows? Does it feel like you're cheating? Maybe, maybe not. Here's the short story. Two things can happen, and only two things, once you've generated a contradiction. You either, within whatever sequence you're working, immediately after assert the sentence you want, or if you go back to your left side of the, uh, of the two samples, the left sample, or you're in a subproof, you get out and assert the negation. All right, so two and only two things that can happen. James, what are you thinking? And in this sort of syntactic logic, or in this sort of syntactic proofing mm -hmm. the logic, we can do either, or do we necessarily have to have that in the proof that we're doing? You, you don't, and in fact, let's suppose that you don't have any subproof at all. Once you generate a contradiction, you can't get out anywhere. You're already on the main line, right? So you have to assert whatever sentence it is that you want, right? I'm just talking about, um, if you will, tactically. Once you've uh, generated that contradiction, there are going to be two possible moves you can make next. It kind of goes back to Farzam's point about, you know, what, what program, programmatic gates open and what close, right? So, you know, once you've generated that contradiction, and you're sort of, let's say you're just looking at your rules, well, now what do I do? What do my, what do my game rules tell me I can do? Well, I've got one of two things I can do. Now, that's one way to talk about uh, the, the move known as contradiction elimination. That's one of the moves you can make. But, but one question is, well, why? What are you thinking, James? Well, so do we always have Can, can I ask you a quick question before yeah. you move on? You're comfortable with the fact that we have the same argument, mm -hmm. but two ways to prove the conclusion of that argument. Yes. The leftmost side is more complicated visually than the right side. But, but they're both equally saying. correct. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. I, I do see that. Good. I do see the distinction between okay. two ways to prove it, but it's just there are very specific rules to how the proof should be made. Yes. I was wondering which one. They're both, yeah, we would use that, yep. Do you have those thoughts? I don't, well, here's, the, I don't know why there are certain, so so, so there are certain ways that of, of proceeding that just, just feel good to me mentally, and then others just don't. It's like, I'll say, I don't see it, I don't see it, or I have to work hard to see it, right? Um, so, I, I mean, just because I have a preference doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. That's just like saying I like chocolate, right? As long as you are working correctly, that is, you're, you're following the rules, um, the, the worst that you could be accused of by a logician is an inelegant proof. And an inelegant proof is a proof that takes more lines than it, than it could take. So, so 
this side is going to be more elegant, so the right side is more elegant. Well, I don't care. Are you doing it right? Okay. Um, so here, let's think. Let's go back to this notion of a contradiction, right? Remember the candy? Okay. Um, that was what line three of the truth table. No, it was line four of the truth table. Yeah, line four of the truth table was that. That was the scenario that we used. Once you generate a contradiction, you know that somewhere you've got at least one false statement, right? You don't know you don't know which one it is. This goes back to James's, I don't know, maybe um, annoyance that he's not getting the truth that he wants with the truth table because he's always only getting passable values, right? Scenarios under which, conditions under which, sentences are true. So you don't know. You were just waiting for proof? Yeah, okay. because... Well, now you're happy. The, yeah, for the truth table, I was like, what if we just sort of make a, you know, a system of equations where on a separate, sort of a separate um, list, you can kind of define your terms in terms of, like, how the truth is. Well, you will do that. So, for example, you, you'll you notice that, we talked a little bit about this on Tuesday, we'll see it today, uh, specifically in Fitch, um, the contradiction symbol can be used truth functionally, contradiction intro or contradiction elim, right? But it can also be used non-truth functionally. So for example, when you have somewhere in your proof, you know, A is a do deck, A is a tet, truth functionally, no problem. A could be both, right? Um, but in terms of an Anacon contradiction, you'd say, no, you can't have this. You assert the contradiction, and then you justify it by the anacon move, right? So again, that's stipulating a usage of the, the um, rules that we have. So, so going back to why is it that from a contradiction anything follows? Well, remember, if your conclusion must be true, right, then Let's take a look at line five. Then Q must be true, right? Or even if what you assert immediately after your contradiction is not the goal or the conclusion of the argument full stop, it's still the case that whatever you say, you can accept as true because, right, somewhere up above, you've got at least one false premise. So, so that means that, and I know this feels weird to somebody who wants a sound argument, right? But just from the standpoint of validity, you're still making your way correctly to the conclusion. Okay. Now, there are a couple of other ways to talk about this, but I hope that this helps us get started. We'll, keep, we'll, we'll return to this discussion again. Now, here's another um, uh, example of something that might feel odd to you. Number six is the assumption Q. It's, the assumption of the right side of the disjunction at one. And then at seven, I reiterate Q. Here's the, here's the rule, read it. Why would I reiterate a sentence, right? Isn't that as, you know, seemingly meaningless as asserting a tautology, right? Or a logically false sentence or truth functionally or a contradiction, right? A truth functionally false sentence. Well, there are two reasons to say that the reiteration makes sense. In this case, you can't end a subproof with your assumptive step, right? Because every assumption has to get you somewhere, so there's got to be another sentence asserted, right? So you could try and fitch to start a subproof, just make your assumptive step and then exit the subproof and you can't do it, right? So, so you make the assumption you've got to discharge it, pay it back or get back out onto the line that immediately, the, the vertical line that immediately preceded it. So that's one reason. Um, the other is this, sometimes, and this is going to be the case for some of you in very long proofs, you know, you're at line 25, and you're trying to, you know, you've got a lot to look at. It might feel good to you mentally to reiterate a sentence that occurred far above, right? Sort of like, hey, remember we said this? 
Well, I'm saying it again, and then I'm going to use it for something. Right? In this case, we're reiterating line 6 because we need to get out of the subgroup. So assuming I have Q, it follows that I have Q. Right? Remember, you might say, well, why, why are we saying this? Because we have to. Right? There is no detail too small in logic. And this is partly, from my own experience anyway, what is the beauty of studying this. I have a history of being a sort of chaotic thinker, right? I'm going to blame my mom. Um, uh, you know, like, you know, the, the, the structure of my sentences would be off, and I, my word choices were poor. And it, getting from one sentence to another, it's like these leaps, you know? Uh, it was non sequitur after non sequitur after, like it doesn't follow, it doesn't follow, right? Logic just beat me up repeatedly, repeatedly, so that even if I make the same mistakes I used to make, I at least, oh, 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 stop me, uh, let's be more organized, let's be more meticulous in our thinking. Does that mean that I can't be freewheeling and imaginative and creative? No, unless I just am not good at those sorts of things. Okay, so it's really good to not leave any stone unturned whether you guys are programmers or you are uh, accountants or your business management or you're a, uh, uh, an athlete uh, or you are a biologist. I mean, it doesn't matter what you're doing. This sort of meticulous reasoning training is really, really good for all of us. Okay, so can you see what rule we used? Farzad. Disjunction Elam Farzam says that's exactly right. All right, so check the step. Now, if I verify the proof, I won't get anything here because I didn't put a, put a goal in. Um, okay, now, I'm going to leave this up, but what I'd like to do before we move on to maybe some arguably less complicated practice as a way of getting us going is I want to put the... Um, the rules uh, sheet up. If you have your textbook in front of you, you'll notice the following. Is everybody okay with this? You have, if you wanted pictures, did you get what you wanted? I'll leave it up here, right? But okay, because what I'm going to do is this. I'll show you when you open up your textbook. Um, what is it five page five seventy seven or something like that? Um, it's the goal, uh, not the glossary. Summary of rules, 557, I was close. And um, where's the, you guys, where's the whoozy? Just do control plus? Yeah. Okay, so. Ah! <laughs> yeah, I know, I didn't see that. <laughs> Okay, so do you guys remember the, the presentation of the rules from, on the board from Tuesday? For example, um, I just had this. Let me, I'm going to erase the, the board here. For example, I said, okay, P, Q, so P conjunction Q, or Q conjunction P, right? Notice the the version of the rule that they give you over here is visually more complicated, but it's, it tells us more. Uh, it's a more robust presentation of the rules. It says, look, it doesn't matter how many P's you have. It doesn't matter how many sentences you have. You can conjoin, 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 conjoin. Right? So it doesn't matter whether the sentence is atomic or compound, right? And it doesn't matter how many sentences you wish to conjoin, the truth definition of the conjunction is such that anywhere in your proof, you can conjoin, conjoin, conjoin. Okay. Very often, we're, we don't do you know, a gazillion conjunctions in a row. We don't need to, but you can. Similarly, uh, the elimination, right? So you have premise one, and then you have any number of premises, right? So premise, subscript, I, Z, whatever it is, you can pull whichever one you want. Again, it's because of what the, the truth definition of the conjunction is. Okay. 
and then same with disjunction intro and a limb. Right. So now um, the the way that we uh, generate our disjunction a limb. Uh, and I realize that if I, I want to say if I'm not mistaken, it's always the immediate su or their successive, right? So when you're when you reach the conclusion of the first side of your disjunctional limb, you exit the subproof and immediately start the second. Um, technically, you should be able to not do that, and I don't know why I'm not thinking of a good example, but we could always try it and see if it says no. There's no there's no logical reason why you have to immediately go to the second one. Then we have the contradiction. Now remember, truth functional contradiction involves the contradiction symbol. A non-truth functional contradiction, something like A is a cube, A is a dodec, right? A semantic contradiction, right? Or a property contradiction. Um, they both use the same symbol, but there's no rule for a non-truth functional contradiction, right? It's just, this is an anacon, right? Contradiction, justification, anacon. And then the elimination is, uh, is, is, is the same, right? When you, once you've generated a contradiction, anything follows. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, I skipped over negation. Um, and negation intro, remember our easy peasy sleazy hotel, it's one of the, the best way, or ways of, of proceeding. It's so powerful, right? When you take a, a sentence that you know is true in terms of the concept of validity, right? You can prove it true as opposed to you saying, this sentence is true and somebody says, no, it's not. No, it is true and here's why, right? So let's assume it's not true. For whatever reason, psychologically, um, we're, we're very um, swayed, rightfully so, from a truth functional standpoint by negation and trump. Okay, so again, I'll give you a rule sheet. It's going to look somewhat like this, although a little less visually complicated. All right, so... How are we doing so far? What, what's your general feeling here? And if you kind of did one of those things, we've talked, this, talked about this before, especially on a day like this, right? You might be thinking, oh, I could just doze off, curled up on my sofa. Wouldn't that be nice? But here you are sitting on these horribly hard and comfortable chairs. But you're doing well, too. How are we doing? What do we think? Like if you maybe checked out, you check back in again, what, what are you thinking, James? Um, you know, from a practical standpoint, mm -hmm. this, what would be the good design choices for using negation intro versus negation? Is it, is it almost doing the same thing, just for a slightly different purpose? Oh, I see. Okay, so does everybody see what, what James is asking? Let me throw the, the, the tool, tool rule, two rules up here. Because it seems like they could be used in very, very similar well, they must be. In other words, so, uh, why would you use one over the other? Does it just depend on how the time span is of the information that's actually being used? So, here's the short story um, contradiction intro of the truth functional variety, right? So, when you cite contradiction intro in your proof, you're doing it because it's a truth functional contradiction. That's always occurring within, no, sorry, I didn't say that. When you use negation intro, you will always use contradiction intro. Just, you have to. Yeah. On, on the assumption we're talking about a truth okay, functional so contradiction. Which one would you cite? Okay, so if you have the sentence A and not A, that's going to be a contradiction intro. When you have, for example, when you have the sentence cube A and then somewhere else you have dodec A, that's going to, and then a contradiction, that's going to be anacon. 
Now why, okay, don't forget guys, the program that we're using to learn logic is a program that was built by the guys who wrote the textbook, right? So, so, so their presentation of the system of deduction that we're learning is going to is going to involve in terms of the the program, right? The 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 way that they're doing this thing. If you open up some other textbook, right? And I can bring other textbooks along. Um, you'll notice that not every textbook does it the same way. So, in if you look at any exercise, let's say in a Hurley or a Poppy Cohen or whatever one of those textbooks or Baronet, when you generate a contradiction. It's this, so it's some sentence Q, conjunction, negation, that sentence. And you're not working within exercises that even have the possibility of what we're calling an anacon contradiction, right? But our programs are integrated. So there's a sense in which, um, and it's one of, the one of the reasons why we use it here, uh, not the main reason why we use ROI's and Entremendi here is because that's what Berkeley wants, and so we do that because uh, a lot of our philosophy majors go to Berkeley. But the other reason is we get a really robust experience. So what is Anacon? Anacon is just the shorthand name, analytic consequence, which is to say the sentence I am asserting is a consequence of mere analysis. For you, James, the analysis of what the meanings of the predicates and their right. It also is the name of the mechanism in Fitch. It's a justificatory mechanism because Fitch is running in its algorithm in the background. Is that helpful? All right. So, what's our comfort level? How are we doing? What do we think? Are you ready to let's let's practice a bit? What are you thinking, Heather? Oh, yeah, yeah. So you're, okay, yeah. So one of the things you're going to do, um, and, and let me give you, if it helps, if it eases your mind some, well, no, I don't want to do that because I could give you, Um, I was going to say, if we look at a practice exam on Canvas, right, we'll say, oh, okay, I see what, what she's doing here. Um, let me give you an example of a way of learning to derive the conclusion of a valid argument without your having to start from scratch, okay? And, and this will be a version of, of what you might see on the exam, although on the exam it will be more complicated because we'll be more proficient at that point. So suppose that I have the, the following uh, argument. I have uh, A or B, I have not B, and what I want is A or C and D. Okay, so what I'm doing here, because I'm working on the board, is rather than putting my conclusion at you know immediately underneath, which is what you see in, in the textbook, putting it off to the side, say to the right of my last premise here behind the slash is my conclusion. Okay, so now and I, you guys may find you like color coding, you may find you don't like it. I use it because I'm trying to differentiate the main line of a sequence with any subproofs. Okay. So, sorry, I left a gap here. That was an, an accident. So, here's what I've done. I've laid out 
the derivation. And then to the right of uh, each sentence that requires citation and justification, I've got a line where we will provide exactly that. James, what are you thinking? Are you supposed to be reading it? Oh, uh-uh. No. Nope. Think of B as kind of like a vestigial tail. Okay. Right? So does, does everybody hear the question that James is asking? Um, he's saying... He's asking, hey, do, do we need B, right? That should B be down here in the conclusion? No, nope. don't need it. So there are going to be times when we, so although we will use everything that's given and everything we derive until we get to the end, it's not the case that, uh, the, that some of what we have in our premises, given or derived, will be part of where, we're, where we end up. All right, so again, I hope this gap doesn't throw you off any. How do we get from three to four? So here's my advice to you. Uh, I'm going to make the, the font a little bit smaller, although you might say, well, that's great, Mia. Now I, can, I can't really see what we're doing. But, <laughs> right? So look at your rules. Look at, your, look at line four. In addition, look at the main connective of line four. What is it? Yeah, it's the or. It's the disjunction. So that should tell you, oh, I've got to go look at my disjunction rule. Rules, I should say. What do you think in James? Um, well, we, we are using one, right, to set up the disjunction elimination. That's here. You're exactly right. So disjunction elim. But take a look at three and four. Three and four. How did you get four? Comes from three. If I have an apple, it follows that I have an apple or or something else. Or something else. Right. Yeah. I have an apple or I have both, I don't know. What's a D fruit? Disjunction introduction. Yes, I'm busy trying to think of fruits. That's dragon fruit. Yeah, thank you, Heather. Right. So I have an apple, therefore I have an apple, or I have a cherry and a dragon fruit. Make stuff up. We're okay with that. We then set off. Remember, we, we're never going to justify a, an assumption, right? Whether it's in our givens or that we further assume. So skip line five, move on to line six. Where did our contradiction come from? Two and... Well, two is not B, so what, what contradicts not B? No, two is not B. What contradicts five. not B? Five. Yeah. Contradiction ends there. Right, so, so suppose the argument goes something like this. Again, there, there, there's, there are no stakes here in terms of, at least so far as I know, you know, something profoundly important, you know, politically, more legally, morally, whatever, right? I have apples or I have bananas, and I don't have bananas, so I have apples or I have cherries and dragon fruit. Well, let's assume I have apples, so I have apples or cherries and dragon fruit. Okay, now let's assume that I have bananas. No, I just said I don't have bananas. I can't say that. So I have apples or I have cherries and dragon fruit. Yeah? Contradiction elimination from six. Right? And then, haven't we just proven from either side of the disjunction at one? And then the sequence is three to four and five to seven. Sorry about my board work. It gets worse, just so you know. <laughs> my lines are all wonky everywhere. What do we think? <laughs> 
And you know what? I didn't I didn't realize this because I've never been in a classroom buddy with her, but Professor Gulick's rage is so perfect. I'm so jealous. Yeah, mine's just like <laughs> It's like I've been drinking all morning. That'd be great. Sorry. <laughs> Either what do you think, Jamie? That explains it a lot for <laughs> What, me drinking? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank How are we doing? So what do we think? <laughs> what, what were they? I said that explains a lot. It does. Yeah. That's what I'm using anyway. You can just type everything and then press your letters and then just have like your background and then just go through notes. I know, and you know, I actually just so I've got all sorts of PowerPoints and all that sort of thing. Um, I know. I think that that's probably the smarter thing to do, huh? Yeah. If you know, okay. Well, we got to go back. I mean, and I one of the reasons why for logic I like the board work is because unfortunately we don't have our our computer lab, I'm sorry, so not all of us can, you know, be working on the FITS program. Um, all right, so we, we're, we've got some time, we had some time now to digest that example. How about this one? Um, let's see, let's say A function equals C. C All right, you ready to, to fill in the blanks? By the way, I hope that some of you are saying, I think I see a strategy, right? So remember, B is our conclusion. B is right now nested up inside a compound sentence, right? We can't just reach up and say, see, B is there, right? So going back to something that James said earlier, I, I want to push on this idea of what we're doing in a derivation when we're presented with premises. The conclusion is implicit, right? Our job is to make it explicit. We need to extract it. How do we extract it? We employ rules. What are those rules? They are truth functional rules, which is to say they are rules that allow us to say that this inference can't be false. That's a short, short story. James, what are you thinking? Hang on. Is there a way to prove that? Like, that this is the truth? Yeah, let's do it. Ooh, sorry, hold on. Hold on. Look at that. Isn't that pretty? Okay, no, I know it's not visually pretty, but yeah. Okay, so line nine means the justification and citations. Line eight does, line seven does, line five does, line three does. What do we think? So, so here, now let me try and push a little bit more on the idea of a strategy. 99 times out of 100, from here to the end of the semester, when we set up our proof, which is to say we're going to set up a structuring subproof, it's the blueprint, it's the sort of template, it's the dots, right, that we're going to connect. 99 times out of 100, we look to our conclusion as the sole or almost sole guide to working from the premises. So we work backward from the conclusion. I say 99 times out of 100 because take a look at, oops, sorry, take a look at uh, uh, line one over here, right? And take a look at line three. When you, so here's a, here's a strategy. When you see a disjunction, Eliminate it. Right? So this is like the Miyagi move. Did you guys ever see the first uh, Karate Kid? Right? Do you remember how, what's his face, Ralph Macchio was, Mr. Miyagi made Ralph Macchio just like polish the cars, wax on, wax off, wax on, right? And poor Ralph Macchio just like, man, this is like child labor. This is not okay. But what happens? 
He doesn't know why he's doing it. But what happens? Come on, at the end of, spoiler alert, what happens at the end of uh, Karate Kid? He, what? <laughs> you know this more than I do. I only know the Miyagi move. He crane kicks? Yeah, that's at the end. Okay. He, like, sees Miyagi, like, practicing at the beach or something. And then he does that at the beach. It's the Miyagi move. And what's the Miyagi move have to do with anything? Wax on, wax off. Why? He wasn't just getting, he, Mr. Miyagi wasn't just getting cars polished. He, he was teaching him how to block. Right? So, remember I said earlier that some of you are going to say, Mia, I don't get this. Just tell me what to do. And I guarantee you, if that's you, eventually you're going to say, I want to understand now. I know what to do, but what does it mean? Right? And then some of you are going to say, I need to understand before I can. So, this wax on, wax off is like, say, look, guys, when you see a disjunction, this is what you do. Okay? That's your Miyagi move. Ready? Tell me how you got number three. Yeah, you, you dismantled what at line one? Yes, right? Conjunction -y limb. So if you're not sure about that, look at conjunction -y limb. Look at the rule. Look at what we just did. Look at the rule. Look at what we just did. Okay, James, what do you think? You have to Oh no, A is just hanging out there. He's like, hi. And well, then we're leaving A behind. We don't need A. We what do you think? Well, I'm just saying if you're going to conclude that one side of the conjunction is too clear, the other side has to be clear, so you have to have two lines on it. You you could, but it would be superfluous. But here's why. When um, not only because you don't need it, but also when you're told the conjunction is true, that means both sides must be true. So you don't have to say, I'm just reminding you that it's true. Is that yeah? Okay. So we pull that. Um, now, what's going on here with line four? Why is four and why are four and six the beginnings of successive subgroups? Disjunction, exactly. Take a look at the disjunction. At line three, and John says, hey, let's set up wait, disjunction elimination. So I can say from three, four to five, six to eight, disjunction elim gets me nine. But now let's, let's backfill. Line four, I'm assuming I have B, therefore I have B. I'm just reiterating it. I, I have to, right? Now I'm assuming that I have C. Now I'm taking the second half of the disjunction, assume I have C, but didn't I just say at line two? Right, so we, we've used line one. Now we're going to use line two and six. And what's the rule? Contradiction intro. Good. And then you're, somebody said a limb, you're right, that's next, right? So we generated a contradiction, therefore anything follows. What do we want? We want B. So that's what we're asserting. And then we've already filled in our conclusion in advance when we were, as, as, almost as soon as we were structuring the thing. Okay, what, what's our thinking here? Are we liking it? Are we, like, so it, would you mind um, telling me where, how you might, how you would rate your confidence level in terms of uh, how you, how you think you're doing, but then also I'd like you to rate your kind of general happiness level. Is this stuff that 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 is making you happy, or is it making you sad and miserable and all that? So, so happiness level, I'm seeing, eh, okay. Uh, what about confidence level? Kind, yeah. Okay, good, good, good for you. Now, if the confidence level is here, remember, there's nothing wrong with you. It, it can take a bit. Um, I don't know if this helps, but I was listening, uh, when I was listening to the radio this morning, there's a, uh, a mathematician who's the first woman to win a certain mathematics award, and she works on really hard stuff because, as she says, um, she's bored when she understands things. 
She only likes to be confused and challenged by the confusion. So let's hope that you say, okay, I'm a bit confused, but this is, this is good, this is exciting. You know, logic's not gonna get me. In fact, you know that there are two class mantras. One of course is, if Mia can do it, I can do it. The other one is, whose ass is gonna get kicked? Mine? No! Logic's gonna get its ass kicked because it will not conquer me. Kind of a long mantra, I know, but we can we can tidy it up. Okay, we're how are we doing? Pretty okay. Yeah, it's not gonna fit well in a bumper sticker. Yeah. Of course, my favorite bumper sticker is you out of the gene pool. Um, all right, so here here's my advice. Um, give yourselves about 20, 30 minutes a day. Just working through textbook exercises. Don't forget that uh, the textbook will give us the you try it, and those are meant to kind of get you used to the, the what and the how of what we're doing, okay? So give those a try. Also, don't forget, the more practice you uh, complete, the better things go in terms of, of pre-completing, let's say, exam. Uh, exercises, but also getting you uh, to the proficiency level that you want to have.